our host, our host Joe Kamalingi, spent nearly two decades in the broadcast television industry across four different markets and in three different states. He started as a news producer and photographer, and in 2030 started his own video production company. Since then, he has been helped many, many business and individual to tell their story, both online and through television. Before I pass over to Joe, a few quick items to note: you'll be muted for the event, so we encourage you to type question in the Q and A box. We'll keep monitoring them and later in the session try to answer them as many as possible. And you'll also have a chance to unmute yourself and ask question directly later. This event will be recorded, which will share the replay. With that, Joe, over to you, and look forward to the session. Thank you so much, and welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. It's my pleasure to be able to share about on-camera presence. And if you're curious why we're starting with on-camera, uh, if someone were to come to you as a financial representative and wanted to talk about the differences between a Roth IRA, SEP IRA, traditional IRA, but never in their life had ever saved a penny and were in debt, you would probably start with the idea of just saving some money before you get into in-depth things. And so I start with on-camera presence because I think it's a great place to start. It's something that is important no matter what you're doing across platforms when it comes to video. And it's a skill that is not often taught, worked on, or really explained at all. So with that, we're going to dive into um, the presentation here. So we're going to start with talking about why, again, we're going to do on-camera presence. All right, so telling a story is the fastest way to connect to human beings. It's just a, a fact. When you share a story with someone, they get to know you. They get to know more about you than any other way. It's what we've done since the beginning of time is come together, share stories. Video, however, is relatively new to that game. It's an acceleration course, right, over the last uh, several decades and into the uh, 20th and 21st century, it's it's become a way in which we communicate. Through COVID, we wish we could communicate less through the camera, but we have to, and we had to kind of learn some of those things or learn on our own. And that's where I want to be able to help out is so that you're not kind of learning on your own. And the reason why I'm used to it is, again, as she was explaining my background in television. Uh, so I started off behind the scenes, but I always wanted to be on camera. And it's one of the most difficult things to learn to communicate through the camera. And we're going to walk you through some of those things today and a little bit of why it's difficult to communicate through the camera. And in full disclosure, I'm going to show you one of the first times that I ever uh, was on camera, per se, and one of my first times on college. And you can see how bad it was. And so... Uh, I was sharing with a business group not too long ago, and I did a quick little post during the middle of our meeting, and they went, well, how long did you practice that? And I said, well, not really that long at all. I just kind of made it up. And they were like, well, that's so easy for you. And I said, well, the next meeting, I'm going to show you uh, where I started at, because I think that's always important. So the first thing to note, telling a story on camera is not natural. Right now, I'd love to be able to stare at all of you instead of the camera. That's what my brain wants me to do. But um, we're designed to look each other face to face, right? The, you think about sitting around a fire, telling a story that goes back to the origins of human nature. In fact, when you entered this room, if you had your camera on or you enter into a Zoom room, it really kind of throws you off because the first thing you do when you come into a public space is before you can even have a thought, your brain wants to say, am I safe? Are these people happy that I'm here? Do they communicate that back with a smile or some sort of uh, cue to me that I'm in a good place and I'm okay and, I, and people are glad that I'm here? Well, that obviously does not happen with the camera. As I mentioned, I'd love to be able to have, you know, kind of a virtual thing where I could look at all of you all at once instead of trying to stare at this lens uh, because my brain tells me that this just doesn't feel natural. It's not like I'm talking to a human being right now. I'm trying to communicate through this lens. We are designed to communicate face to face and telling a story is difficult with that. Public speaking obviously is next to death when it comes to fears because our fear is that when we 
communicate face to face, we're not going to get that response that we want. And so that's why we have that fear. But when it comes to the camera, you might remove the public space, if you will, you might remove the faces, but it creates this whole other um, aspect in which the co the camera's cold. It doesn't add energy. When I talk to this camera, when I'm live on air in television or broadcast news, there is no reaction. You might have a little bit from the people that are next to you, but it becomes difficult because you're trying to communicate in a way that your brain just kind of wants to reject. It wants to see people's reaction. And you can do a little of that as, that will, as we'll talk. That's why I love the Q&A at the begin, at the end, um, because I can get a chance to look at some of the camera screens, pause for a moment and communicate with you. But for the most part, a lot of times when we're doing video, we're doing a Zoom presentation like I'm doing now, uh, the camera is the main way that we're gonna wanna communicate. And number one thing I see oftentimes in Zoom or just in other settings with a camera is people are kind of dropping their eyes down here. They wanna share, they wanna look at the screen. And while that's okay, sometimes in a breakout room, or other settings, if you are supposed to be the person that people are hearing from or talking to, maybe asking a question, the best thing to do is engage your eyes with the camera so that the people on the other end actually get that sense that you're staring at them. As I said, it's just hard to stare at the lens. It's hard to engage with it. Not that you have to do like a deer in headlights and stare <laughs> at it uncomfortably. You can look down from side to side, um, just try to be as natural as possible, but you want to engage with the camera. Number one, people often ignore it in situations. Again, whenever they're presenting or maybe you're appearing live on camera. And I'm going to try to tailor this as much as possible to a situation that you would be in. I'm bringing Zoom in. I talk about video marketing in this series, or maybe you're appearing on camera as a financial expert. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that. So again, if you have questions about specific scenarios, please feel free at the end to ask some of those questions, but I'm gonna to try to tailor it as much as I can. But again, we wanna create a setup. You find a good setup with the camera, find a good camera you like so that you're not fighting it, that it can be a little more friendly, knowing all the while that you're used to presenting to people that are in front of you. And so with that in mind, you wanna make it as safe and as comfortable as possible. So get a setup, set it up as close as you can to where you can look directly at it and you can engage with it. Right now I have a webcam, but we can talk about different uh, ways in using your camera that you have. You can use it on whatever you are, but just get comfortable with it and record yourself and see what it looks like and look back on it and kind of uh, just get a feel for what you're like on camera. You got to start somewhere and we'll talk more about that. So um, look at lighting. Right now I have what's called a Elgato ring light. Uh, when you saw mine. So I uh, I have a light, I have a camera, and I want to see, I practice around with different cameras to see what the setup is like, what my background looks like. If I were open up the shades behind me in the window, you could see light streaming in behind me, what I call like a heavenly light from above, um, which I'll get to you see there and see. So play around with it, see what you got when it comes to lighting and get something again that's comfortable for you because there may be something that's a professional light, but that it doesn't really work with what you are trying to do, or it's too much light. Sometimes too much light can be a problem too, if you're not used to it. I put avoid virt virtual backdrops in there, unless you have a green screen, just because, I mean, I can show you later what it looks like if I blur my screen in the backdrop. Again, it depends on the setting that you're trying to do, but sometimes with virtual backdrops, you'll notice in Zoom as people lean in and away from the camera, they break up a little bit. And so it can cause some distortion in there. But if you, I've seen people nail it where they have a green screen, simple little green screen backup behind them backdrop, and they can throw in a virtual backdrop or can blur kind of uh, what they call bokeh, but Zoom can do it for you. But sometimes again, it can cause, cause a little bit of a, a haze with you. So it again, depends on the setting you're in, but I just say, if you're trying to do a pre presentation, sort of like I'm doing right now that I would tend to not use a virtual backdrop. Um, if you're in Zoom, like we're doing now, I've practiced several times on Zoom, but even with this presentation, I got with uh, the team from you know the CFA and the society and, and, and talked a little bit about trying uh, some different backdrops, trying the Zoom setup to make sure the presentation runs as smoothly as possible. Now there's always gonna be issues. You'll see when I try to play videos on here, sometimes the sound wants to mess with you. Sometimes 
um, uh, the setup doesn't quite go right. But if you're practice and ready, you can kind of roll through it. Comes from my backdrop. Again, we're talking about on camera. You know that you're going to generally not be as comfortable. So you want to create as many things in the environment that make you as comfortable as possible. It just makes sense, right? You're used to that probably in any universe that you're in, you set up, whether you're talking to a client, you're in a boardroom, it's just that Zoom or and or any other video chat or video presentation has added another element. So you got to make those other elements so you're comfortable with them and set yourself up for success. All right. So I talked about heavenly lights from above. I do this in my office and I do a lot of presentations from there. I like the uh, on the left-hand side, you can see kind of that 3D backdrop that I've put. 3D is a little bit better as long as it's not growing out of your head. But that light from above, I like the light fixture. But all of a sudden, if it's in the shot, I can have uh, just a backdrop that doesn't work. My face is a little bit darker on the left picture. On the right, you can see that I have my ring light. I changed the backdrop up just a little bit. But um, the blinds behind me are closed. I wouldn't choose that as a as a as a backdrop, but the lighting shows you a little bit more where my face is more well lit. You don't want to look like you're in the witness protection program and you have kind of the dark in front of your face. So lights from behind, testing whether you even want to use overhead lights, those are all things that, again, can add and up the level of professionalism when it comes to being on camera. Now, if you are appearing on someone else's podcast or, again, a more of a broadcast setting, the lights are going to already be preset. And so you can ask them those sorts of questions. And um, we'll get to that later about makeup, hair, the, what you wear. But if you're controlling the environment, then you can just play around with it and see what works for you. Again, ring lights, tons of people, you probably maybe already have one, play around with it, see what it works. But also know that other lights, sunlight, you, you will not beat sunlight. It wins every time. So you want to control as many of those things as you can when you're getting set up. All right, so in storytelling and on camera, confidence is key. If you tell a good story, you know this when you're sitting down with a client or you're sitting down in a situation, the more confident you are, the more they're going to listen to what you have to say. And if you sound hesitant, you know, people are going to tune you out. And I put that in this aspect as we set up storytelling because, again, creating that confidence on camera is so important. I've met a lot of people who could probably command a boardroom, but you put them in front of a teleprompter or a camera that level drops down, their energy level drops down, and they're just not who they would typically be in person. Now, what I explained in the beginning kind of makes sense as to why, but in order to do it on camera, as you know, confidence is so important and creating that confidence in front of the camera is important. As you'll see, again, I'll show you mine. Uh, I thought I was confident the first time I went on camera. What ended up happening was a completely different story. So, uh, remind yourself that you do know what you're talking about and most of the other people don't. So as you're sharing, uh, don't worry about kind of what people are thinking and what's going on. Again, your brain's going to try to tell you that. I don't mean to go all Stuart Smalley, if any of you remember him from Saturday Night Live, right? The pep, pep talks that he would uh, that he would give, my favorite episode when he was trying to give a pep talk to Michael Jordan on uh, one of the, the episodes. But again, these are basics, but sometimes we forget them when we're on camera that we remind ourselves that we've got this, that we're rolling through it. Again, we've set ourselves up with making ourselves comfortable in the environment and with the camera so that we can speak confidently to what we're doing. Because you know, so often we get in that situation and things that we know, numbers that we know, traditional things that we're confident about, all of a sudden we get on camera and we can forget it just like that. Or you get in an environment where you're on live television. We put people live on TV they just didn't translate. I mean, they were experts in their field, but all of a sudden the camera's on and it they maybe sound a little bit hesitant when they're speaking. Podcasts now, a lot of them are video podcasts, so that would be a scenario too. Um, so there's all sorts of scenarios where it's, it's just important to remind ourselves of that. And again, you can speak on camera the same way you would in person. It does take some time to get used to it. You've noticed I'm looking down from time to time. I am engaging with the camera when you can't see me on camera. But for the most part, uh, you want to be able to speak to as if there's pe other people behind the camera. You want to engage. You want to have a um, speech rate, all those sorts of things that match as if you were in person. But you have this different element of looking directly at the camera like it's a person. And 
I, I I'm going to speak about teleprompter as we kind of go. It's something that you know, it's made available now for a lot of people, but it is really difficult because you have that kind of issue, unless you're really good at it. And I've known some people who've never done it and have become really good at it. If you stick around to the end, I'll show you one of my favorite scenes of someone reading teleprompter in a, in a movie, kind of a, a joke, but uh, it's, it's just difficult. And so I, I try to bring up little elements here and there that might trip you up when you're, when you're on camera, because you want to, again, speak like you would in person and engage the camera in the same way. All right, so how do I get better? How would you get better? Well, practice, right, is, is the number one thing, practicing on camera, but you're gonna be your own worst critic. So look for big things, not ticky-tack things, small critiques, um, show it to other people, ask other people that are in your Zoom presentations, maybe pull them aside, but look for big things that you have going on. When I show you mine, there's a couple of things that jump right out um, from the first times I was on camera. And that way you can not be overcritical because you're always going to be that as you look back, you end up not liking things. You'll be like, oh, this was a great presentation or this was a great appearance on video. And then over time, you might be, well, I don't really like that or vice versa. You thought it went horrible. And meantime, it actually wasn't that bad. I have to speak a lot of confidence into clients that I put on the video. I try to do it in question and answer format to make them comfortable, but I have people who run large companies, CEOs, vineyard owners. And sometimes I just have to tell them, no, actually you did better than you thought. Sometimes in our own mind, it was a disaster and actually it's not. And if you continue to roll with it and you continue to look critically, but not over critically at it, you'll start to get better. You can work on breathing techniques, how to sit up, how to and again, I know in certain situations, some people are used to commanding a room and they're really good at that. But you get in a chair or maybe even if you have a standing desk, you can slump, you may actually forget to breathe. It happened to me the first time I was ever uh, on real, like not college, but uh, air in, in Reno doing sports. I had like an eight minutes worth of stuff. And by minute five, I was out of breath. Now, sports is hard because it is one thing after another, but I literally couldn't speak anymore because my I was pretty nervous. And on top of that, so excited to get through it that I literally forgot to breathe. So you work on breathing techniques, setting up, doing some of those standard uh, kind of breathing and practice exercises, those will help. And then finally, I say, you're not going to go zero to Tom Brokaw overnight. I was a Peter Jennings guy, but I think zero to Tom Brokaw sounds better. But uh, the, the idea being that uh, it just takes time. And depending on where you're at, some people are more natural at it and are able to just gain that confidence on camera and engage and others aren't, but you got to start somewhere. And being in this place and, and taking this training is part one. I'm going to put actionable steps at the begin at the end. Um, because again, I don't want it to just be a training for training sake. We love to do that. Just get more information. I want you to have stuff that you can actually put into place so that you can get better and that you can tell yourself, all right, it doesn't matter where I'm starting. Uh, I will be better on camera by the end of it. So having said that, I want to share the first time on air. Um, actually, the woman you're seeing on the screen right now ended up becoming a news anchor in Southern Oregon area and uh, was quite good. But this is the first time on air. Oh, I just decided to skip right over it. See, you gotta kind of roll with it. All right. Information on upcoming shows and auditions, call 323-7469. All right. A lot in his new backyard. Okay. The president hopes that these Sunday baseball games will rekindle the American pastime, especially among children. Those kids looked really cute out there. Yeah, look out, T-Ball. Uh, what's uh, Wolfpack Baseball is also making news. Joe Camerlinghi is with us now for a look at sports. That's right. Well, when we come back, I'll tell you what the Nevada baseball team is up to, as well as a story about an extreme sport that might prove to be the perfect summer hobby. That and more coming up next on Nevada News Lab. All right, so problem number one, uh, the anchors were talking to me, and I wasn't even acknowledging their existence. Um, I was staring straight at the prompter and the screen and, uh, yeah, that's kind of, uh, was problem number one with, um, that as I was nervous also doing this elbow thing, um, that was, uh, kind of on the side, by the way, obviously dating myself of when, uh, I was there though. I didn't go in the seventies as bad as that, uh, set looks. Um, but, uh, 
really, I, I was just so nervous. And the easiest thing to do is actually interact with the anchors. And I didn't even do that because I was so nervous and I was staring straight ahead at the screen. I would like to think I improved over the years. And I walked off the set thinking, oh, I was great. I nailed it. Then I watched it and was kind of like horrified. And it didn't really get any better. I can see if I can pull up some of the uh, things here as we go along <laughs> uh, where I was, uh, yeah, didn't didn't improve a whole lot. Um, uh, pick another spot here where it's not, uh, I kind of want camera. If you're interested in rock climbing, one option is REI. They offer free use of the rock climbing wall and equipment on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. and on Sundays from noon to 3 p.m. All ages are welcome. If you would like more information, you can call REI at 828-9090. Well, Joe Sellers is making a return to the sidelines. Former head coach at Wooster is returning to coaching after a two-year absence. Officials from Bishop Minogue High School say that he will not only take... Okay, also that head bob, not a good thing. The fact that I'm pretty pale, not a good thing. And so I kind of want to stop it there because I want to get into some of the things. Not only that, the blazer that I was wearing, uh, way oversized, looked like I borrowed my dad's blazer. Um, blue and black are best. Now, it just depends on which what what kind of setting you are in again whose podcast are you hosting your own uh facebook live videos what whatever scenario you're in obviously dictates but if you notice anchors or if you're going to appear on a broadcast blue and black are always best white some sort of blue shirt depending on again the setting that you're in when it, when it comes to the camera i'm wearing kind of a shirt that i'm comfortable with and i knew was on camera i could also show an example of something i did last week where i broke my own rule wore a shirt that was a little busier with patterns on it and sometimes it can just cause the camera to freak out a little bit and you can get a kind of a little bit of a pattern forming on the screen so uh, you can wear a white shirt white shirts are good if you cover you're going to cover it with a blazer because white on camera will kind of just blow up the screen. Makeup, I want to bring that up. It helps, especially if there's lights above. If you're appearing in a professional scenario, makeup is great. If you're on Zoom and you have most of the cameras, you probably don't need to worry about it. I'm not wearing it. I have a, even with a higher camera, yeah, I can, I can have some issues. Ladies, if you're, uh, again, appearing somewhere, you're asked to prefer appear professionally in, in some sort of uh, scenario where it's not your own setup, I would ask them, you know, with 4K lighting with and, or cameras and lighting, it can be really harsh. Even in that studio there, I was, I was pretty, pretty light. I don't think I had anything on. So that's, that's a factor to think about depending on, again, where you're appearing and what you uh, what the setup is. Stripes and loud colors, they can be distracting. I worked with a nail polish company. I mean, they produced some amazing colors, but it was hard because I had to create a studio setting for them for their YouTube live. And it was a daughter and a mom that owned the company and they were wearing contrasting colors and one sometimes would be loud and the other one wouldn't. And it creates sometimes difficulty with lighting. So sometimes it can look great in person, but again, on camera is different. So look at it. If you're in Zoom and it's a little muted, maybe it's not going to be an issue. But if it's somewhere else, it's just something to think about. Stripes and loud colors can sometimes be distracting, especially on camera. All right. So we're going to kind of wrap up the first session here a little bit before question and answer. I like to leave as much time as possible to talk about specific scenarios. I'll set up uh, the next segment as well. But these are questions as you go through a week or as you go through asking yourself, where am I honestly at at speaking on camera and what do I do, need to do um, to get better? Um, and so it's, I just want a basis of like, hey, can you go and can you practice? Can you go back and, and try things out and begin to ask yourself, um, where am I at when it comes to talking on camera? and record yourself. Maybe you've done it before. Maybe you've done it a lot, uh, but you want to get better from wherever you're at. And you can look back at some of those things. And again, where am I appearing on camera? What am I doing? Am I leading a group on uh, Google Meets or uh, on Zoom? Am I going to start podcasting or am I going to be doing something where maybe your firm sends you scripts? Again, I'm trying to tailor it to what 
you have going on. I know a lot of people in the financial industry, it's very strict or they have very specific lanes they're staying on and time types of areas where they're appearing on camera. And again, I'll, we'll open it up to, to questions in just a moment, but practice that practice what you're going to be doing because each setup, some of the basics again, are the same for appearing on camera. There's just slight differences with what you want to practice, what you want to wear, uh, how you want to help yourself. And so ask those questions, where am I at? Am I practicing what I'm going to be doing, how I'm going to appear on camera? It sounds basic, but so often people don't do it. They just blow it off and they don't actually work on whatever platform they're using. I had to practice a little bit with Zoom. I've been in Zoom a lot, but it's different when you're hosting and you're working through Zoom in that format, as opposed to doing a video podcast or live television or doing some of the recorded videos that I that I do. And I'll get into video storytelling. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, recorded video versus live video as well, because that'll change up a little bit how you're doing it. It won't change up a lot when it comes to engaging with the camera and the basics. Again, this is why I start where I start with engaging the camera, because it's important no matter what platform you're on. It's just as kind of, as you know, as you build those skills, there might be specific areas in which you want to improve. And we can talk about a little bit about setup as well. I'm going to open it up for questions before I have a, a kind of a, a closing slide where I can talk a little bit more about one-on-one -on -one coaching and some of the other things that I offer, but um, I want to be able to open it up for questions right now. Switch. Okay, I see a Sue um, with her hand raised. Lemon, would you like to, if, if they are able to unmic now, we can go ahead and, uh, uh, or unmute. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joe. I've got a number of questions. Some, sure. uh, maybe a little bit of a, a rapid fire. How much of your body should you show? I'm noticing that you're actually kind of mid chest up uh, and I'm sort of just head. So what's really the most, the most effective? That's a great question. I try to frame with is just a little bit of room above my head. And then generally speaking, you can come to, if you notice most anchors, you're going to be about at your belly button. Um, and so what you don't want is I'm going to mess with my camera a little bit is so much headroom and someone looking up at you or kind of where you're kind of looking down. The best thing to do is to create a situation where you can engage with the camera and the basis of like, they're looking and they can see your eyes. They can see a little bit of here around you, but you don't want distracting things. When I talked about light too, noticing where you are, so you don't have a plant growing out of your head or something of that nature in your background. Um, those are the kind of things you want to look up, look at, but that's a good question about setup is, is generally you don't want too much headroom. And then kind of down here with a presentation, I have a little bit, a little bit higher up again, there's a range of things, but you can also check out and see what you like. Maybe you like a little bit more where you're having something that you're demoing. In podcasts these days, I use that as a great example. Is, so you can see my microphone down here. All of a sudden, that's the new thing is like show the microphone, show the headphones, things that you wouldn't do years ago. You can kind of show behind the scenes now. But I hope that answers your question is generally just not too much headroom, not too much room down below. You said you have more questions. May I may I ask some more questions? Is that yes. all right? Yes. Okay. So I noticed you're using your hands a lot, and I was just at a body language um, seminar yesterday um, uh, for Women's Day, and they talked about you know when you use your hands at this level, it's an extra energy, it's extra sort of hype versus when you actually have them down by the belly button area, which we talked about. You just mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, um, are you actually amping things up just a little bit? being on camera uh, with your hands or what should you be doing with your hands? Because often uh, we all look very sterile. Another great question. And you don't. And you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Another great question. So I was taught long ago, I'm Italian. I talk with my hands. And so if it becomes distracting, when we get back to looking at things, uh, when you look at yourself on camera, if there was something where your hands became distracting, then maybe like if you always start, sometimes if you're always starting here and you're moving here, or I know they're joke with politicians, you're doing these things and, you know, Bill Clinton would do this. And it depends on if it's, it becomes distracting, but I think talking with your hands is great. And sometimes 
if you try to, I've had a, a on air coach talk about when you're trying to restrain yourself, there's an anchor who literally had his hands like this because he was forcing himself to try to not use his hands. And it became more distracting than when you use your hands. Yes, I guess it generally means you're a little more animated, but I think the other thing to to do is to find who you are on cam camera and who you're comfortable with when you watch it, because there is no one set style uh, with things. There's again, general rules, but uh, the more you discover who you are, how you're able to engage with the camera, the more you'll realize there may be something that one person finds distracting, another person doesn't, but you're comfortable with it. And the general uh, idea is there's not 10 out of 10 people who are going to tell you, whoa, you know, what you're doing with your hands is completely distracting for me or whatever it is. So that's kind of my general rule is to see, engage it by that. Thank you. Um, length of time talking, um, just that, you know, listening to one person talk, um, you know, I've, I've been involved in putting programs together myself and you try, at times you try to mix it up. So there isn't somebody sort of doing the monologue and, what if you're mixing it up with a presentation and videos, perhaps that's different. What what is the general rule for maximum engagement? So I say the rule with any length of video or anytime you're talking is what works and what engages with people. So you can bore someone in 10 seconds just as well as you can bore someone in three minutes. And so there's that that kind of general rule. And I'm going to talk more about that when we talk about video storytelling. But mm -hmm. I tried to break it up in that presentation a little bit. I try to show a little bit of video. I'm going to add more video elements in kind of as we go to anything that you can break up just talking, what we call a talking head, the better. Um, in my first one, I have a little bit more talking over the screen. And the ones as we go, I add a few more videos in. But I would say too, give yourself a break at some point to breathe, especially when you're new. And depends, again, on what environment you're in. Are you talking about Zoom? Are you talking about appearing on podcast, hosting your own podcast, doing a Facebook Live? And I did do some research on some people that do shows that are uh, certified financial advisors. And the good news is, is the bar is not that high in certain cases with some of the people in storytelling. Some people are engaging on camera that I watched, but their subject matter kind of bored me within the first couple of minutes because, well, I shouldn't say that the subject they chose wasn't bad, but just how they presented it was kind of boring and it because they were on camera the whole time and they weren't necessarily grabbing my attention with where they were at. So I would say as long as you can hold someone's attention, great. If you notice yourself or someone else tells you, hey, even within the first 10 seconds, I lost you. then yeah, that's why I, I, there's no set and fast rule, but most people's attention spans, it just depends on how fast you're engaging them. Yeah, it might be only 10 seconds, but you might grab them right back. And as you'll see in video storytelling, I try to open strong, close strong when it comes to video, especially in pre-recorded. Does that help answer your question? Yeah. And just if at some point, could you tell us what kind or, or are there ring lights that you recommend and where to actually mount them? Uh, because sometimes they can also create, you can see them in people's glasses and, yep. and so on and so forth. But I know if there was, I have one and it works, but I've, I've played around with it a fair bit, not here actually, but um, when you look on Amazon there, you could choose from 200. So which ones do you like and recommend? So I'm using an Elgato um, and I have the Elgato face cam, though I may change it up next week. I've ordered a couple of different face cams. I wanted to try to use things, not my professional cameras. Um, I, and yeah, you're very right about the ring light. That was a very good one. I was going to bring that up because I just shot a video last week. If you mount, I'm going to actually follow me a little bit. Let's see if I can show you. This is the ring light here. Here is a setup where you can mount something for your phone. But the problem is, is if you mount your phone on that, and I use something that's about $10 that mounts your iPhone on there. And your iPhone actually has one of the best cameras. It's going to be way better than your typical Facebook or excuse me, it's typical um, MacBook or uh, webcam. Even this webcam is an Elgato. The phone is better, but you are going to get that ring in your eyes. You can see it a little bit in the top of mine right now. And my ring lights behind me, I can move it a little bit and then I can always crank the light up. So that's another trick is I can move further back and move the ring light back. 
Um, if you are, and I know there's a CEO who had set up for lights, ring lights aren't as good as, I mean, this one's in the 150 range. I know there's a lot that are cheaper than that. Um, but if you can put like just your typical, like uh, the lights I have are like a couple hundred bucks. And if you're going to be doing a lot of it, you can put regular lighting that isn't the ring light. So it doesn't end up in your eyes. And I kind of created an Amazon list that, that has some of that. All right, uh, James, go ahead. Yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a, uh, as a hobbyist, I don't do video as a hobbyist, but I happen to buy a DL DSLR that has video capability. It's a Sony camera. Mm -hmm. Would you suggest trying to use it? I mean, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty wrinkled dude already. So I don't know if, uh, if high def is really where we want to be. <laughs> hey, I, I, I think that shows wisdom. So uh, I, I, I like it. Um, Here's the thing. I have used my setup. There is more technology now to you sh set up your DLSR with uh, your computer. It used to be something called a black magic box was the number thing, number one thing. Elgato, the same company that makes the ring light and the webcam that I have, they have a wireless device that you can plug into a DLSR. I have not tried that software. Uh, I know people who, if you're able to do it permanently, let me say this, whatever you can do most often and is repeatable is always good. And again, whether you're going to get the value out of that for the headache that you're going to have, that's another question is, is like, are you someone who's regularly doing it? Is it something that's important and adds value to whatever you're presenting? Um, that's the kind of number one thing I look at. And then, yeah, it's, sometimes it's even smoother. I, I had a, a webcam that was showing a little just not the way I wanted it to, even though it was clear. And so sometimes like the iPhone itself will smooth you out a little bit. It'll do a few things. The, the iPhone is one of the best, but again, how you place it, how you set it up um, is kind of key. Does that help answer? Yeah. <clears throat> and let me see if we go through. Okay. I see Laura. Oh, this would go. Oh, so um, James, you had something on there about practice equals run a one person zoom and record. Um, I can answer that too question. Yes, uh, you could do that. You could put yourself on camera and um, you can record with whatever it is and try to engage. Like I'm looking right now at my camera and try that and practice it out and just record. That's what I actually did for this presentation because a lot of the material I've done and I've done recording, I've done live, but I haven't done it in a zoom format. So all I did was practice it out and see what I liked because there's lots of different Zoom features now that can seem really cool. I could have put you guys in a virtual classroom, for example, but I didn't like the way that looked. So you can you can really just practice that or use your iPhone and record something. Again, I want it to fit whatever you're doing. If you're trying to practice to go uh, live on something else, it will help you a little bit, but know that that might uh, be a little bit different. All right. In... Uh, Laura, the question in Zoom, uh, speaking to multiple people on screen, how do you focus on the iPad camera while answering a question and also see the reactions of others in a natural way? That's a great question. It is difficult. That's why it's, I want to see naturally all of you and I want to see smiles. I want to see laughs at the right time. It's just human nature, but sometimes you just have to go with it. You sometimes just have to look at the camera. And then when I'm doing the Q and A, I was looking at James or I was looking at Sue or I'm looking at you and now Laura and I can see you. And so it's okay at some point to acknowledge it. It just, when it becomes something where you completely ignore the camera or it's not the right time, that it's difficult. And there's, there's actually in a lot of ways, no perfect way, because again, it's not human it's not human nature, but what I'm trying to do in this is make the person on the other end feel like I'm engaging with them, even if I'm not getting that feedback. But there are certain times, again, where I can kind of look and see, or if you're asking a question, I want to see what, you know, maybe you're raising your hand for a second part of that question. So you can, this is the question and answer time is kind of that that time, but it's, it's difficult no matter what. I, I just especially found that over the years, and that's what a background in training. So would you recommend then looking at the camera and then like you said, you can kind of look away, but keep that focus right on the camera. Yes. Instead so of... I, 
yes. looking at the tiles or the yes and i'm looking at you right now and i have set it up so that you're kind of off to the side of my screen right there and so when when you're asking a question i can it's natural people aren't going to expect me to automatically engage with the camera when they know you're asking the question and then again how you have it set up too where um are you in i'm on the little thumbnail videos but i could do the grid and I have it. So there's all different ways that depending on how you like it in Zoom. So I've now pulled out, actually I'm in stereo. I'm behind, I'm behind and in the front on this setup. I haven't done that before, but um, the bigger your screen, if you make it so it's like the Brady Bunch, I call it when you're all and we're all in our little boxes, um, then you can uh, kind of look down and, and it, may, it might make it easier for you to look down here and then back up at the camera. But what I was talking about mainly is just people who are looking at the boxes and looking and responding, which is again, okay, if you're just in a think tank or some sort of other Zoom, whereas when you're in a more professional setting, engaging the camera. Okay, does anyone else have questions? Asking about the replay, we are gonna, um, I do see that we have that. Um, we'll have the replay of all of them. So, and these will all kind of fit together um, in a, uh, um, way of starting with on camera and I, just to, out of curiosity, if someone wants to share, because I've talked again, a lot of people in the financial industry, but what's the number one way for that you're going to be using this? Is it zoom presentations? Is it, uh, appearing Facebook live social media? I know there's restrictions on what you can share in the financial industry. So if maybe some of you can popcorn style, just let me know some of the things that uh, you're curious about when it comes to how you're going to actually use video or be on camera. I'll go ahead. My, for, for me, it'll be more just zoom calls where I'm on calls with multiple people and doing discussions and questions and answering. Okay. Board meetings and meetings. Okay. Question asking. Okay. I'm going to do video email and um, try to do more marketing with my video. Okay. Jay, I'm definitely going to hit some of that with Loom. Have you used Loom for your video marketing? Okay. Oh, awesome. So I'm going to introduce you to Loom. It's a great way to contact current clients. Um, if you wanted to run over something in the portfolio and someone's either out of town or can't connect, Loom is a great tool to record yourself and your screen at the same time uh, to be able to share uh, just what you would do in person, uh, but in another way. Or if you're looking to add potential clients and customers uh, running through something, whether it's a new, you know, a, a new rate or a new thought for them that you would want to share with them. Loom videos are a great, great tool. Anyone else that, uh, anything specific that they have about? I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but anyone here that is going to appear on camera. I I watched, um, what's Scott's last name? He was on, um, local TV and radio down there who's doing market updates. Um, does anyone have any done that or have any uh, want to do that at, at any sort of level appear as a professional uh, on camera? It's okay, if not, I'm just was kind of curious. Not seeing any hands. The opportunity has not presented itself. <laughs> okay. So Laura, I saw your hand. Have you done it or do you want to do it or... Uh... Oh, you're still muted there. I, was, um, I saw your hand up, Laura. Oh, interested in in if you had time to to cover something like that, I'd be interested. Okay, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about that in, in the storytelling and the picking of topics. But um, I also, before you go, so I offer kind of a one on one coaching situation, depending on what you're doing with Zoom. This is kind of we've covered a lot of it. Um, I see yeah, clients in Zoom meetings, but uh, I can share one last that. So um, I do kind of offer that if it, and it, and I'll cover a little bit of it, but 
Um, making contact when there's something going on. I'll just throw that little nugget out there to local television stations. Or if you know someone who hosts a podcast and throwing yourself out there when there's something going on, you can do your own, but that's the best way to do it. There's something called assignment editors at all news stations, including San Francisco. They probably have a bunch of them and it may or may not make it through there, but they're kind of the watchdog. But the more you make yourself available and let them know you're available for interviews when any sort of thing goes on in the financial industry or market or whatever it might be, um, the the more likely you'd be able to appear in, to, in broadcast news. But I mean, there's also all sorts of ways to be able to do that same thing, to record yourself doing that and get yourself out there if you want to appear on a podcast or um, things of those nature. Podcast people are always looking for guests. They always want to not be talking. And so if you want to be able to out there to gain, gain some potential new clients and customers, that's a great way to do it is appear on podcasts because they're always looking for guests. And it may not always be video too, but um, there's a, a lot out there when it comes to that. All right. Let me... Joe, thank you for, uh, if I may ask one more question. Um, yes. Appreciate the the session you're having today. Um, when you have your sort of ring light in the background, I find, you know, I have a light here, but it's it's really blinding. Is that kind of normal? Is there no way around that, or do you happen to have any tips on sort of how to orient that? Number one, don't stare at the light. Don't go towards the light. <laughs> um, no, uh, it is there. It's a comfortability thing again. Um, Anytime I turn on my lights, I tell people, I try to make people aware of it. It is really hard uh, to do that, uh, to be able to not. Now, if you can create a scenario where you can put them up above where it's not a ring light, that will make things easier. I mean, in any broadcast studio, the lights are going to be up above fixed on a ceiling and pointed down. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to be bright, but they're not right in, in your face because any typical... Um, other lighting, interview lighting is three-point lighting. You have a key, a fill, and a backlight. And the key light is going to be right, right in your, your face. And it's, it's hard. Again, play with distance. See if you move it back a little bit and brighten it or dim it a little bit if it's closer to you and see if it adds in. But there's a level of professionalism that you probably don't have to get too bright depending on on what you're doing and you can still add a little bit in and just set yourself apart if you're doing any sort of presentation. Does that help answer your question, Al? Got it, great, thank you. Perfect. All right, anything else before we kind of wrap up? And uh, the last talk, by the way, the last one will be picking topics. I don't know if you saw that on there because um, whenever you're doing stuff, and then this will work for Zoom presentations or whatever it is, it's always, Difficult. Now I get, again, there might be something where you have to cover a broad range of things, but today I tried to stick to specific things and break it out. So that'll be, and then the next one, we're going to show some examples of, even if you're doing a presentation of say dog, see dog, what you're talking about, you notice I'm showing video on the screen. If it doesn't match, I leave it out. So we're going to kind of dive into more of uh, matching your video or whatever you're presenting to what you're saying. And that'll be lesson number two. But unless there's any other questions, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I enjoy doing this. It's uh, what I love to do, helping out. And uh, yeah, there's always an opportunity to uh, afterwards or as we go through to ask more questions and connect with you further. Cool. And just a quick reminder, we do have the next session of the two part, well, three part series next Thursday uh, and the one about staying on topic the week after. So join back uh, with Joe and us to learn a bit further. And my takeaway from today is that I'm going to first welcome my background. You can see I have my background here. Um, so hopefully next session I can I can make that more effective. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. love the Golden Gate Bridge, though. It's 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 iconic. So <laughs> yeah, that's her way. Since I couldn't see it quite kind of in person, so I have it here. I can see it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us again, and thank you, Jill, for joining us again. Uh, we'll see each other next Thursday, I guess. Um, stay in touch. We'll see each other back. <laughs>